Good afternoon. I'm Adam Lupel, IPI's Vice President, and it is uh, my genuine pleasure to welcome you to this special policy forum, Understanding Masculinities to Dismantle Patriarchal Power Structures. I'd like to thank our co-hosts, New Lines Institute and Equimundo Center for Masculinities and Social Justice. Uh, thank you for partnering with us um, during this critically important time and in anticipation of the annual Security Council Open Debate on Women, Peace and Security taking place on Wednesday. The, um, this summer's uh, highly anticipated New Agenda for Peace, Secretary General's New Agenda for Peace calls for the dismantling of patriarchal power structures. And it calls for a commitment to the eradication of all forms of gender-based violence. And that includes recognition that gendered power dynamics affect women, girls, and non-binary persons, but also impact and severely constrain men and boys with, as the Secretary General says, devastating consequences for us all. Continued progress on uh, the Women, Peace and Security agenda and progress on fulfilling our commitments to gender equality require engagement by men and an honest analysis of the norms, practices, social expectations and power dynamics associated with being a man. That is to say, we need a better understanding of the many forms of masculinity and their impacts on us all. Among the um, lessons of IPI's past work on gender-based violence, sexual exploitation and abuse, masculinities and violent extremism, is that while gender-based violence is often addressed as if it were a form of deviant behavior, contrary to our social and institutional norms, we know that that is all too often not the case. Rather far too often, gender-based violence and abuse is not deviant, but rather tragically normative. In the context of the patriarchal power structures of militarized or hierarchical organizations and societies, gender-based violence and abuse becomes part of the performance of what it means to be a man and to wield patriarchal power. I find it chilling to think about it that way because it suggests its pervasiveness throughout our culture and institutions, um, although it is true. But I also find it strangely uh, hopeful because it points to the potential for transformative approaches. There are other ways of understanding and performing masculinity, more positive ways, more plural ways, ways we can use to foster and support more peaceful and equitable societies. We have a wonderful panel here today to discuss all this and more. And with that, I will turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Phoebe Donnelly, Senior Fellow and Head of Women, Peace and Security at IPI. Phoebe, the floor is yours. Thank you, Adam. And thank you to all of you for being here today. It's really exciting to see such a packed room of people here to discuss this really, really key topic. And we encourage you to start thinking about your own remarks as you think, as you listen to the speakers, we will be opening the floor up to questions. And we hope this just is really kicking off a conversation. While we can't solve patriarchy in today's discussion, I think that we can start brainstorming and start the process of working together, a process that feminists and many other gender activists have been working on for a long time. So this is our first event of the what we are calling Women, Peace and Security Week. And we encourage you to stay engaged with us. We'll also be having an event in this same space on Wednesday at 1 p.m. on the role of women's organizations in combating gender-based violence and conflict-affected contexts. So hopefully we'll see you throughout this week. I'm very excited to welcome the panel I have here today. I'm going to start by introducing this, each speaker and then posing them a question to kick off their introductory remarks. <laughs> 
So our first speaker to my right is Ambassador Arlene Tickner. She's the Deputy Permanent Representative of Colombia to the UN. Ambassador Tickner, how does analyzing masculinity support UN member states in implementing the Secretary General's recommendation in the new Agenda for Peace policy brief to dismantle the patriarchy? Ambassador Tickner, the floor is yours. Just want to be sure that I don't talk too long in this first. Um, I want to start out by thanking uh, the organizers, um, New Lines Institute, Equimundo, and IPI um, for inviting me to this conversation. I don't think we would be having it several years ago. And I think that that speaks to the advances that we've made um, in putting on the table issues such as gender inequality and patriarchy. Um, I also would like to start off um, by acknowledging the Secretary General's audacity in the new Agenda for Peace policy brief. Um, for the purposes of the discussion we're having today, I want to highlight three important claims that are made in this document. I'll repeat a bit of what um, Adam Lupel has already stated. Um, first, misogyny is identified as, as an important part of narratives that justify non-conflict related violence prevalent around the world. I think this is something new. Second, the brief calls for the dismantling of patriarchal power structures, which we've already mentioned. And third, as Adam also pointed to, patriarchy and more generally gendered power dynamics are associated with the oppression of all women and girls, but also with harm to both women and girls and to men and boys, with which the issue of masculinity is also therefore grounded. Um, taken together, I think these statements offer us a sober reminder of the challenges that we face in undoing patriarchy, which is alive and well in the daily realities of most of the globe, as indicated by both lagging progress on the SDG goals related to women and girls, backsliding on certain rights, including sexual and reproductive health, and reversals even in agreed upon language within the context of the United Nations on matters related to gender-based violence, uh, gender-based sexual violence, among others. Um, and yet, without a clear sense of what we're talking about when we refer to patriarchy, I think we'll continue to be hard pressed to think about how to do away with it and its potentially noxious consequences. My point is that it is impossible to dismantle anything, in this case, patriarchy, until we fully understand what it is. And I think one constructive critique I at least have of the new agenda for peace policy brief is that it fails to define its terms. So let me offer some definitions um, and you'll see I'm moving away from the question that was posed. Obviously, analyzing masculinities is fundamental for talking about how to undo patriarchy. So there's my answer to the question. But I think we need to do definitions as well. I understand patriarchy to be a, social, a political social system rooted in socially defined gender roles that operates to create both oppression and privilege. It insists that certain men, heteronormative and white particularly, are naturally superior to those deemed weak, specifically females, including trans women, and that they have the inherent right to dominate and rule through distinct forms of power and violence. Patriarchy, as we know, manifests itself in multiple overlapping and mutually reinforcing types of oppression, exclusion, violence, and inequality that are upheld in any number of social spaces in the home, at school, in the workplace, in places of worship, by the law, by states, and by extension by international organizations such as the UN. As a lens on reality, patriarchy allows us to see and understand any number of things. The gender nature of roles within the family and the concentration of care work in women. The gender pay gap in the workplace. The underrepresentation of women, in states, including in legislatures, in the executive branch, in militaries, as well as in international organizations. The absence of female protagonists not involved in a sentimental relationship involving a male in most Hollywood films. And the prevalence of gender-based violence. I had an article that I wanted to pull out. I'll see if my, yeah. I've studied the case of Semenya Castor for quite some time. You might have seen this article in the opinion section of the New York Times yesterday. Semenya Castor, Castor Semenya, sorry, is a South African athlete um, who is um, intersex. Um, she was um, identified as such um, after she ran too quickly um, in several competitions. Um, and uh, she's now written a book on the obstacles that she's faced to compete as a woman, which is how she identifies 
given the accusation that being intersex gave her an unfair advantage. Um, I think she also speaks quite potently to the effects of patriarchy in the, in the, in the world of sports. Um, so just wanted to point that out. The second term I wanted to define is masculinity, and I'll talk about it in singular first. Um, I understand it to be the socially determined and power infused roles that men and boys play and the multiple dimensions in which this power operates in society. Masculinity entails a dominant position and related social practices, even for persons that face other structural conditions, such as racism, capitalism, homophobia, transphobia, and others that make these practices untenable. And by this, I mean to suggest that we're not only talking about dominant men, but social practices and routines in which many other men, even though they can't apply the practices associated with dominant masculinity, end up repeating as well. Raymond Connell's term hegemonic masculinity, which was coined in the 1980s, first underscored, along with the work of Bell Hooks, who I went back to to think about this presentation, the power of some men over others based upon whiteness, social class, or gender identity. More current ones, such as complicit masculinity or marginalized masculinity, refer to the ways in which different vulnerable groups of men and boys who are prevented from achieving hegemonic masculinity due to those other structural barriers are socialized to uphold nonetheless dominant group norms, thus reinforcing hegemonic masculinity and patriarchy, or whatever it is you choose to, to call these things. I might add that many women are also active participants in these processes. To complicate things even further, many would argue that patriarchy rooted in a specific idea of dominant masculinity and racism are also foundational tools of capitalism. Indeed, as many thinkers have shown from their onset, the logics of capitalism and colonialism established both gender and race as organizational categories to place peoples and cultures along a hierarchy of social and economic worth and power that's operated historically to reinforce subjugation and inequality. Therefore, the provocation to dismantle patriarchy and to envision masculinity differently may also demand that we engage with the racialized capitalist heteronormative structures and logics to which both are wed. This is much easier said than done is what the point that I'm trying to make. But I think several things come to mind here and I'm gonna to try to wrap up first, both Patriarchy and masculinity are performative and participatory. You might note that I subscribe to Judith Butler's idea of the performativity of gender. I think patriarchy falls into that category as well. And what I mean by this is that they're both continuously recreated through gendered acts in which most people participate. As such, they can't be wished away simply with our minds, nor erased by making headway just in gender equality, even though such advances are fundamental. Although the resilience of both resides largely within their naturalness and the naturalness with which they operate, for people, authors like Butler, their performativity also means that they are categories that can and should be retooled. I think in the case of masculinity, we might talk about feminist, mas feminist masculinity, um, non-patriarchal masculinity and whatnot, and replaced in the case of patriarchy. I don't see a way of retooling patriarchy in, in, in a form that would make it acceptable um, for the types of goals that one would want to achieve related to gender. Second, my sense is that an intersectional lens that underscores interconnected and overlapping forms of subjugation, which much of the work, work done currently at the UN and by some member states is already taking into account, um, uh, that, that is already taken into account and that acts upon these to foster genuine conversations with and links between distinct groups and situations of vulnerability rooted in gender, race, ethnicity, sexuality, social class, disability, and others is a key step. I'm fortunate enough, and all this I'll end, to represent a president, Gustavo Petro, and a vice president, Francia Marquez, in Colombia, that wholly subscribe to the need to undo patriarchy, that would subscribe to what I've just said, um, and the need to combat racism and rethink capitalism in ways conducive to reducing inequality, oppression, and violence against both humans and non-humans. Here I'm thinking of the environment, among others. Um, having the courage um, as states to call things out by name seems another crucial contribution to moving this, com this conversation ahead. And so I'm making this bold step in representation also of the president and vice president that I represent. Thanks. Thank you so much.
Thank you, Ambassador Tickner. I think you answered a better question than the one posed to you. <laughs> Thank you for taking us through that definition, because as you said, we can't dismantle or challenge what we don't understand. So really appreciate that. And I wrote down feminist masculinity as a new term to explore and think through. I'll now introduce our next speaker, Kat Fodovat. She's Principal Deputy Director at the Office of Global Women's Issues at the US Department of State. And we'd like to pose the question, what policies or programs has the US Office of Global Women's Issues put in place to begin the long process of dismantling patriarchal norms? Thank you. Am I on? Okay. Thanks so much, Phoebe. Um, I'll answer that by saying we're doing everything that Ambassador Tickner just said needed to be. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> um, we are desperately trying. Uh, first of all, I want to start off by thanking our hosts, IPI, New Lines Institute, and Equimundo for bringing us all together to have this very important discussion on this topic today. I also want to thank you all for your commitment, your leadership. I've worked with many of you over the years, and it's truly been um, you know, a labor of commitment and love for many of you. I'm really honored to be here with such esteemed panelists who just even sitting in the back room, we just started plotting and scheming and what else can we do and what else can we push with? And now I have all of you to pull in. Um, I know you all are working very hard. So I also want to thank all the activists and everyone that's working in civil society organizations and as well as our colleagues across the different sphere for all the work that you're doing and your interest today too. So in the Secretary's Office of Global Women's Issues, or SGWE, as we call ourselves, we lead the department's efforts to promote rights and empowerment of women and girls through U.S. foreign policy. And we know that patriarchy really is about gender power dynamics in the political, social, economic spheres. And, you know, U.S. Um, has really recognized patriarchy, the roles of masculinities and femininities by really approaching things through a gendered approach. So we have a national gender strategy. We are looking at ways to engage men and boys as well. We know that we need both ends of the population to make sure that we are engaging and looking at those power dynamics. We know that all boats rise together when we work together. So it is important, though, to acknowledge that the Department of State and most of all, if not other institutions, were founded and designed by men and are rooted and continue to be re resourced and um, promote patriarchal norms. Patriarchy is vast. It's insidious, as we are seeing in conflicts around the world today. It's replicated and made invisible by the nature of having existed for centuries. Um, she was just uh, noting and quoting bell hooks. I'm going to quote the Barbie movie. <laughs> Even the Barbie movie underscored this point with one of the men responding to Ken that they still do patriarchy. They just hide it better. But by pulling it out into the open, by talking about it, just like we are today, we are able to more effectively combat it. We have to be proactive in calling it out whenever we see it, and it cannot be hidden. Sunshine is truly the best disinfectant. So our office is tasked with three primary policy priorities, all of which include efforts to combat and undercut the negative impact of patriarchy, preventing and responding to gender-based violence, promoting women's economic security, and of course, advancing the women, peace and security agenda, or as my son likes to say, women are powerful she <laughs> Often institutions rooted in patriarchy are most comfortable discussing gender-based violence, but only on the surface level. This is because it maintains patriarchal understandings of gender. Men are protectors and women need to be protected and are defenseless without men. You can see this in some of the aspects of the WPS agenda, as well as painting all women and girls merely as victims of conflict. We try to go beyond that. Recognizing that gender-based violence is fundamentally rooted in gender inequality and unbalanced power structures. As we know from pioneering researchers like Valerie Hudson, that the security of women is the security of states. Countries with higher levels of gender equality are less likely to experience armed conflict and more stable. Women's economic security also has transformational impact on women's lives and society writ large. When women are able to equitably participate in the economy, they have financial security and their lives can change. The benefits to countries and global economic markets can't be understated either. When women are economically empowered, it boosts productivity and increases income equality. Lastly, the Women, Peace and Security agenda. 
elevates and centers women and girls' experiences of conflict and crises in the responses. By prioritizing gender equality in political and security decision-making processes, studies have routinely demonstrated that those processes are more successful and longer lasting than the outcomes and improve all of society. So we work throughout the department on gender integration, looking at and making sure that in national security policies that what we are working on includes gender analysis throughout all of the efforts that we, that we take place. Um, we include and make sure that we are consulting with and having the voices of women who are the most affected engaging with those policymakers. And really we try to make sure that through our policy development, we are doing things like bringing awareness, training our own infrastructure internally, making sure that they understand what patriarchal structures are, talking about masculinities, looking at the effectiveness. So it's not just about education, it's talking about the effectiveness of the work that we are doing both on a policy and programming basis. I've had the honor of actually working with and sponsoring some of the projects of many of the organizations here. Um, we work on everything from uh, masculinities as well as fatherhood projects, looking at mapping, including extremism issues, um, and as well as online harassment and abuse. We have several partnerships that go beyond uh, multilateral institutions as well as with other partnered bilateral organizations and um, countries. So we look at these areas in order to do our policy promotion. Our programming also takes into consideration and works on gender analysis, no matter what the project is that we're doing. And again, we try to speak to the entities within the department that work on everything from security to economics to make sure that everyone understands that as, as those projects and as those efforts go forward and do better, it's much more effective. So we look at that data analysis as we are promoting um, the work that we are doing in our office. I hope that answers some of those. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kat. And thank you again for highlighting not only the external work your office and you are doing, but also the, the hard internal and important internal work. I will next turn to Gary Barker. He's president and CEO of Equimundo, the Center for Masculinities and Social Justice. Gary, what are the most effective ways to engage men and boys in conversations on patriarchal norms and harmful masculinities? Where do you see the most resistance? Thank you. To those two questions, I want to ask, how long do I have? Um, <laughs> You know, I think the um, I'm coming into this conversation with some reflections of lots of young men I talked to last week, young and young adult men in Dubai, um, a country of about 80% immigrant worker population, a lot of men from South Asia in particular, taxi drivers, hotel workers, and the rest, all kind of migrating to live up to a version of masculinity, trying to be providers for their households, often getting to see um, their loved ones at most once a year. So thinking about, you know, I think um, your comments about the about patriarchy and capitalism overlapping are just so clear. Um, many of you probably also saw the article last week in the New York Times of Nepalese men going to uh, the war in Ukraine for about $750 a month. Um, I bring up those two examples just for us to sort of think of where are men as humans and individuals in this picture and kind of their complex relationships. I think the, you know, the terms that we use and the structural analysis that we do about gender, we often lose sight of the faces of just men's very complex relationships with power and patriarchy. Um, we as an organization have been trying to build um, something of a field of practice. I would say it's a lot of experiments in challenges and you know, humility about what can work to change dynamics, individual relationships, power dynamics um, in terms of men, boys in their relationship to gender equality and to healthier ideas about masculinities. Um, I wanna start with kind of where we are globally, I think, just a snapshot, and I know that sounds kind of big and presumptuous, but a few reflections there, and then talk a little bit about some of the practices that we think can show us some ways forward. Um, one, just a wake up call of where we are on the issue globally that I think for us who work for gender justice have to think about. We've been studying now for about 15 years, kind of men's views on gender equality across nearly 60 countries, partnerships with UN Women, UNFPA, through the International Men and Gender Equality Survey. Household surveys now carried out in 60 countries, young men ages 18 up to men in their 60s. What do we see? Global snapshot is we are going backwards. Young men are less likely to believe in the cause of gender equality that we have been championing for all these years. 
then we ask why, which men are more likely to support, which men are more likely to resist. The economic precarity or the perceived economic precarity of some men seems to be probably the biggest issue that drives them to think gender equality has gone too far, I'm afraid of being called out. It is decentering um, kind of me and the world perhaps for some men, but also that we're not perhaps looking at men's own vulnerabilities. There's a bit of both. We see both resistance as well as we see what it means to be economically marginalized men. Um, there's a lot that we could talk just about that issue. The other, of course, is to watch the organized movements that are pushing back on the agenda that we've been leading. And you can name the country of the week in terms of elections and electoral politics of how this is playing out around the world. And we do some analysis of that as well, of how organized right-wing fundamentalist movements have taken on messaging around masculinity and are now making it front and center for many of their messages. We so far have not been very good at countering that. That sobering message, what are we finding at the practice level do we think can work? There's a lot of small scale work, discussions with men in different settings. There's a lot of programs that talk about engaging male allies as champions that tend to be sort of one-off talks. Sometimes things happen beyond then, but a lot of those just end up being quite superficial. Our really small programming can work, but there's huge challenges of scaling up. Few places where we have seen some promising advances engaging education sectors and places where that's possible in conversations and approaches with boys and girls, non-binary individuals as well around promoting ideas around healthy masculinities. Embedded into schools, bought in by leaders of school systems, we've seen that those can produce effects and we've done some measuring of those. Health systems, huge place where we can see men come into um, or need to come in for services. Also places where we can screen for violence and offer services. Brazil's made some advances with, on that with the National Men's Health Program, closely tied with the Women's Health Program, engaging men via prenatal visits and using that to roll out a national program that now reaches about 75% of couples who show up with a pregnancy in the public health system, a pretty massive example. In Rwanda, we've been working with the Ministry of Health to roll out a national parent training program that shows among participating couples in a randomized control trial, more than a 40% reduction in men's use of violence against a female partner, both parents reduce the violence against children and increased participation by men in unpaid care activities at home. So we can see that at the program level, some things can work. We've talked about the media as a space. We've got to look at where young men are these days, more often than not to be online, streaming, watching. Um, that can be organized television. We've done some research on that topic, and I'm actually headed with some colleagues to Los Angeles next week. We're talking to folks at the Television Academy, looking at both results of research that we've done with the Gina Davis Institute, but also talking with content makers about how do we present stories of healthier masculinities. There's a few studios and writers who are interested in those kinds of conversations. The care economy, I think, was brought up, and we see that as a place where men can see self-interest. They can see benefits to their own lives. We've led for about 10 years together with the organization Dean used to work with, Sanke Gender Justice, global, the Global Men Care Campaign, which is as the goal of getting men to do 50% of the unpaid care work and also to be allies for, pay, for the care economy and for care equality. Um, if there's any bright light, at least in the last 10 years, as we've measured men's care work, they may not be doing that much more, but they are saying they're doing that much more. <laughs> um, so again, that might be something encouraging to say at least there's now a possibility of reducing that gap between the amount of care work that many men say they're doing and the amount that men should be doing. Um, and that more men, depending on how we ask the question, see the importance of the care economy, um, the importance of care in their own lives. Um, so we think that's one way that we could look ahead. Um, I wanna end just looking at time, so there's a lot of time for conversation. We can look into any setting where we've been doing research or partnering with colleagues, and it is easy to fill up sort of the, the glass half empty. I mean, there's a lot of reasons to be very pessimistic about this movement toward engaging men to be allies for full gender justice in the world. But if we look more closely in every setting, there are as many voices who resist harmful ideas about masculinity as those who are buying into them. And I think that's the challenge with our interventions. And I believe Dean will talk a bit more about this as well. How do we identify those voices, those spaces, those narratives that go against 
the hegemonic versions. And I worry a lot about our language because it is structuralist as it needs to be, but it also seems like it strips out the, the possibilities of individual men to push back, of systems or spaces to push back. Um, and as we take lesson from so much resistance by women around the world to patriarchal structures, we do have to figure out how do we inspire more resistance by men to patriarchal structures, to see the harm in our own lives. We measure that, and I'll end on perhaps just a funny anecdote. When my daughter was in, um, she was 11 or 12 in her middle school, and she is half Brazilian, half US. She said, Dad, come to school and talk about that stuff you do about men. Only now we're in the US, so don't talk about sex, but you can talk about, that was, that's supposed to be funny because we can't talk about sex in the US. But she said, talk about, um, talk about how this affects men. And so I gave the example of men's life expectancy compared to women, how we know that about four years of the difference is related to social factors, not biological. Young men in the audience, the 12 year old boys were looking with their eyes wide open, thinking about the impact on their own lives of harmful ideas about masculinities. One of them wrote me a letter the next day saying, you know, said, Nina, give this to your dad. And he said, Dr. Barker, thank you for sharing these examples of how men are also affected by patriarchal and harmful ideas about masculinities, but now I'm worried about dying. Um, and, and I cringe the same way that, that we all did hearing that, but I think that is it. We've got to help men see our stake in this more equitable future, to feel it and to understand it in our own health and well being, to understand how it affects our relationships, and to see how can we be inspired by the political feminism in the world to be allies for it. I think it starts with that enlightened self-interest to call it that, but we've got to push it toward the more political aspects of it. Not instead of everything we're doing to empower women and girls, but as a part of that work. Um, I will stop there, thanks. Thank you so much, Gary. And for those of you who don't know, Equamundo has many resources. I think it's the images survey, right, mm -hmm. that you mentioned. So all of these resources Gary mentioned, or many of them I imagine are available publicly. So I encourage you to look that up because I know there were some fantastic examples that Gary just provided. I'll now turn to Sarah Douglas, who's the deputy chief of the Peace and Security Division at UN Women. Sarah. Why is addressing masculinities important for UN women's work? Thank you so much, Phoebe, for the question. And thank you to all the organizers for inviting me to this very interesting discussion that I think I've been waiting 20 years working in the field of women, peace, and security to have at, in this setting. It's very exciting to be here talking about masculinity, patriarchy, and really the root causes of some of the problems that we're facing as a world. So to answer the question why, I'll start by setting the scene. Uh, Wednesday, the Security Council will be reviewing our annual report on women, peace, and security, which has very alarming statistics and also reflecting the negative trends on peace and security in the world, which have really exacerbated in the last few weeks since we actually published the report. Last year marked the eighth consecutive year in a row that global military expenditure broke all boundaries and raised to a level of 2.2 trillion. The number of women and girls living in conflict increased 50% since 2017. At the same time, funding to women's organizations in conflict zones has decreased from 0.5% to 0.3% of all ODA in fragile settings. So that's really the answer to why, because the male dominated approaches to peace and security, as well as to development and governance, you know, there can be a long list, have really enabled the current state of the world from our point of view as women peace and security advocates. I'm gonna, I'm not gonna quote Barbie or Butler like my colleagues, but adding another quote from Gloria Steinem, which said when she said that Sexism and patriarchy is the ism that makes all other isms possible because it's in the home when children first observe their mothers getting treated differently from their fathers. So this is really at the root cause of equality, justice, and peace from the women peace and security point of view. This also goes back to the Beijing Platform for Action, which recognized the need to engage men and boys and also, very importantly, that gender equality benefits men, women, boys, and girls. And I think that's also a really important uh, message that is resonating in the new agenda for peace, and also something that 
even goes back to the World War I and World War II advocacy for transforming the military industrial complex and reinvesting resources into education and development. And now we can also add climate change. So in terms of some of the reasons why, I think I've named a couple, but now to get to some of the how, we have a lot of different approaches as UN Women, and I'll just name a couple of examples. We work very closely with the African Union through the African Women Leaders Network on something that is called positive masculinity. So it's a little different from feminist masculinity, but this is something that's been developed in the continent that's actually recognizing that the specific issue of violence against women and girls is actually driven by gender relations, that it's about power. It's about power between men and women. It's also about women's inability to access services, justice, hold their, the perpetrators accountable. And that also the structures themselves have to transform to address these issues. What I think is interesting about the new agenda for peace is it's ex extrapolating that premise to the realm of international peace and security. The Secretary General specifically says that patriarchy and power relations are driving conflict. So now how this filters down to some of our work at the country level for UN Women. I wanted to give a couple exam examples. There's a lot of other work that UN Women does in the area of care and other aspects that I'm not going to touch on because it's not specific to peace and security. But I wanted to mention some of the work that we've done at the country level. So first of all, in terms of conflict analysis, we've been working with our partners, including DPPA, DPO, and others to improve the UN's gender responsive conflict analysis based on our recognition that when we go into a conflict setting and only talk to men, only talk to, only see the issues that men are facing, we're not going to have a accurate understanding of how the conflict and peace are affecting different segments of society. One of the most interesting examples from my time working in South Sudan was about the cattle wrestling issue. I think we all have heard about that issue. It was a huge driver of conflict, tit for tat, cattle raiding, that would then spark regional conflicts that threatened the whole peace process that ended up going all the way up to the president and vice president level. But one of the key reasons for that cattle wrestling was because you had many displaced young men coming down from Sudan into South Sudan and they wanted to get married. So they needed to get the cattle to be able to pay bribe price. So this was actually an issue about masculinity at the very core of what was driving this conflict, but that was never what was seen at the most senior level who always saw this as an ethnic conf conflict rather than one that really had very deep gender roots. And I think once that recognition started to spread, it also enabled more engagement with local authorities about things like child marriage and uh, bride price, which then at least helped to identify what the root cause of the system was. Then when I was working in Timor-Leste, we did some very interesting work with lo local chiefs. At that time, there had been uh, domestic violence legislation passed across the country. And because this is a context like many of the contexts we work in, where the state is not very present in a lot of the rural areas, they rely on the village chiefs to essentially dis disseminate information and also be the custodians of law and order in many senses. So by working with the chiefs, we were able to, through our partnerships with local women's organizations, explain what are the parameters of domestic violence, what even is domestic violence, what are the recourses, and also train them to understand at what point do they need to call the police. If it's just a argument and people are shouting, no need to call the police, but once the altercation turns physical, then they do. So it enabled these chiefs to have the information and knowledge about what this domestic le legislation actually contained and then to be able to apply it at the local level. So I wanted to spend a little bit of time also talking about the gaps because I think that will be interesting for our discussion. As I've just described these examples, I think our work is still very much at the local level. It's very much in the realm of protection protecting women from men, rather than really engaging men to be allies in the search for gender equality. Not enough working on participation and leadership of women while engaging men. 
Related to that, I think a lot of our work is still very much as a zero sum game. I think we have not been able to convince any of our uh, male decision makers that giving up power or giving women power would be you know, a threat to them. And I think also interesting to hear about the um, care work, because that certainly resonates, I think, with a lot of the working mothers in the house, in the family, um, that we don't necessarily have this uh, concept of gender equality really being about empowering everybody in society and that really filtering down to all levels. And I think we're still really working at the micro level. We're working at the level of you know, villages and, and justices, which is very important, but still not looking at transforming the macro level structures where patriarchy is embedded in such a toxic way. And I think this is the opportunity that we have with the new agenda for peace. So I'm really looking forward to working with member states and other partners to try to advance the implementation as soon as we can. And I'll leave it there. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you also for flagging the benefits of gender equality. I think that's a really important point to carry with us throughout the discussion. I'm now going to turn to Emily Prey, who is the director of the Gender Policy Portfolio at New Lines Institute. Emily, can you discuss the importance of research and policy analysis in understanding and addressing patriarchal power structures and harmful masculinity? Um, thank you so much, everyone, for coming. And I also just want to start by saying thank you to Phoebe and to Echo Mundo for putting on this event. I think it's very timely. It's very important, especially during WPS week, as there's more conversations about how to include men and boys in the WPS agenda. Uh, for a little background on New Lines, we're a, a policy think tank in DC. And I started, I founded our gender work in 2020. Um, and our goal is to bring more nuance and gendered analyses into foreign and domestic policy spaces, not just in the US, but internationally as well. And we want policymakers to know that gender analysis exists, that it's a tool for them to be more effective in their work. Um, it's not something to be scared of because it has the word gender in it or women. And you know, it's not just a box ticking exercise, as we've heard very eloquently from all the panelists today. Um, and as a think tank, New Line sits in the middle of civil society and government. And so what we can add to conversations about peace and security and conflict and reconstruction uh, is to let policymakers know what the policy relevance is. Um, and I'm just going to keep saying the word policy again and again in my comments, so apologize for that. But you know, it's it's to bring forth what a gender analysis is, what a masculinities lens and a masculinities approach is, is kind of at the core of our work. And we also do internally facing work with our other staff who are not gender experts, but doing internal trainings on gender analysis on the WPS agenda, how they can incorporate that in their work, um, so that we aren't just siloed within our own organization. When we think about WPS and and gender, I. A lot of people, I think, kind of want to stop at, okay, well, we've added women or like there is one woman at the table or, you know, women can now be politicians like we fixed it. Um, but, and, and, you know, participation is a very important pillar of the WPS agenda. But this is all within the overarching structure of patriarchy. Um, which we know is very harmful to everyone. And we can look at women like Marine Le Pen and like Georgia Maloney um, to see examples, women who have risen you know, to the highest levels, but that doesn't mean that it's necessarily a positive force for good for men and women um, in their countries and in their communities. And so you know, it just shows that women as um, the ambassador said that they can be complicit in, you know, an active participants in patriarchy. I want to highlight a report that uh, New Lines published last year that was co-authored by Dr. Kinsey Spears and Caroline Hayes from Ecomundo um, that was about harmful masculinities and the threat to force readiness in the U.S. military, because I think it's a good example of how using, you know, research and policy analysis um, is, can move the dial forward. And so in, in the report, Kinsey and Caroline wrote that the reticence to talk about masculinities and male trauma in the US military fails to account for how harmful gender norms shape military policy and culture, thus impacting the safety and well-being of all service members. 
Unsurprisingly, the U.S. military is shaped widely, um, shaped by widely held gender norms and beliefs about what it means to be a man, what masculinity means, and this in turn it really affects the uh, and impacts the health and well-being of service members when traits like physical dominance and aggression are held up as the ideal. And this can lead to issues of substance abuse, of suicide, and more that Kinsey and Caroline delve into in their report. And so when the Department of Defense is looking at how to be more effective in preventing conflict or how to be more effective as a fighting force, understanding the harmful masculinities at play is really important to these goals. Um, and also just to their the goal of protecting their own people, their own service members who are all volunteers. And so that's, you know, that's why I think that policy analysis and putting this on in front of policymakers is a really important, you know, there's a lot of different ways we want to go about this and everyone on this panel kind of represents, you know, different parts of, of the fight. Um, but I think that report is a, is a good example. And then I just want to also talk briefly about institutionalized masculinities. The question that we're here to yeah. grapple with, which is very difficult, is how can the international system and UN member states dismantle patriarchal systems and structures when they themselves benefit so much from it? Why would you want to you know, dismantle something um, when it's helping you so much? In the short term, it sounds like shooting yourself in the foot when you think about it from an individualistic and short-term perspective. But we know from decades of research and study that patriarchy is net negative for society. So we, we have all of the evidence there. It's just about getting it to the people who can make a difference. Um, and getting buy-in from men is so important for this. And we've talked about education. It starts in the home. Um, I don't, that's, I mean, those were, you know, my key points as well. <laughs> and that we can't really, accomplish meaningful and sustainable change if we don't have buy-in from men and boys um, and also making sure that we don't lump men and boys together like we do women and girls so often which is a really big, good point Gary um, and so it's, it's really great to have men on this panel to see some men in this room I want to see more um, but you know we organizations like Aquamundo, the work that you're doing is really incredible it's really important that it's like fully focusing on on men and boys and masculinities and too often we have words of women and gender, all of a sudden these become women's problems. And we know that, that, that that's not the case. Um, and lastly, it's WPS week. There's been a move in the WPS agenda to look more towards gender peace and security, which takes more fully into account that men and boys and people with diverse gender identities are also actors and victims and aggressors in conflict. And they need to be considered when we're thinking about peace and security. Um, the WPS agenda has become siloed from larger discussions of peace and security as women's issues. And when the words gender and women become conflated, it kind of teaches people that men and boys don't have gender, which we know is not the case. Um, this, limited gen this limited understanding of gender hinders the transformative, transformative potential of the WPS agenda as a policy tool by burdening women with solving issues of their own oppression and victimization. Um, and it also obscures the inter intersectional dynamics of gendered experiences that make women's problems a cross-cutting issue that is relevant to foreign and domestic policy challenges. So anyone who is part of the problem must be part of the solution. I don't have any fun quotes, but I'm going to quote our panelists, um, <laughs> where, you know, Phoebe, you said earlier, we can't dismantle and challenge what we don't understand. And so that's, you know, the solution begins with education. Um, and Gary, you said that we need to help men understand their stake in this. And I think we also need to help policymakers understand their stake in dismantling patri patriarchy and harmful masculinities. Thank you so much, Emily. And I believe some of the publications you reference are also in the back, along with IPI's publications on the topic. So definitely feel free to grab those. I'll now turn to our last speaker who's joining us virtually. Dean Peacock directs the Mobilizing Men for Feminist Peace Initiative at WILF. Hi, Dean. And we'd, Hi, like to ask, <laughs> we'd like to ask you the question, why do we need a feminist peace approach in mobilizing men? What does this mean and look like? I'll turn to you, Dean. Great. Thank you so much, Phoebe. And um, it's really an honor and a privilege to be here. Um, and, you know, really, really appreciate the very thoughtful remarks um, my presentation connects with a bunch of the 
questions that uh, were asked about how we understand patriarchy, how we use the term masculinities, and what it looks like to do structural work to address um, men's involvement in conflict and violence. And so I'm going to try and cover some of that ground in my seven minutes. Um, and I think I wanted to start, um, Phoebe, with a reflection on the meeting we had in Tbilisi now two or three months ago. We brought together as WILP um, and IPI, a number of other organizations, PACS in uh, the Netherlands, a group of about 30 practitioners to think about questions related to men, masculinities, and feminist peace. And I'm reminded of um, comments of a young Palestinian man um, who put a really difficult question to me and to the group um, in one of our kind of sidebar discussions during the plenary. And he said, you know, this work to transform masculinities feels really uncomfortable to me when I'm insisting that Palestinian men transform their masculinities and think differently about what it means to be men, what it means to have rights in a setting of occupation, a setting of ongoing um, humiliation. And um, it really stayed with me, this question of what does it mean for us to do work on transforming masculinities if we don't um, really think carefully about the structural forces that Gary described that are, of course, part of the patriarchal uh, power that everyone has been talking about and the event is framed around. So I sit here with those questions, of course, with, um, you know, a ground invasion of Gaza imminent um, and you know, I, I grapple a lot with the question that is Al-Jabari put to me and to us that day. The second um, reflection I wanted to just bring into this discussion was a comment and some research done by a Cameroonian researcher, Lotsmart Fanjong, who's done some really brilliant work trying to understand some of the structural drivers of the conflict that has engulfed the Anglophone parts of Cameroon. And he complicates the narrative, right? He says, yeah, of course, masculinities is a part of it, but we also have to look at colonial histories of land dispossession, um, continued histories of land dispossession um, by a kind of elite in government, um, often accepting kickbacks and awarding that, you know, awarding land to large extractives, either involved in logging, or the you know, growing of, of palm oil, monocropping essentially, or of course extracting minerals in various forces, forms. And he says, when people are dispossessed of their land, um, they resist, of course. And a lot of his work has been looking at women's resistance to land dispossession in Cameroon. And so what is it that happens in those settings? Um, private security gets brought in, um, brought in with weapons, and there is a quick proliferation of small arms and light weapons, um, and a steady ratcheting up, right, of conflict and lethal conflict. Um, and so the challenge that I think Lotsmark puts to us is, if we recognize that men's involvement in violence and conflict reflect some of these structural forces, what does it mean to address those. And so your question to me at the beginning was kind of, you know, why is engaging with masculinities important to feminist peace? Why is feminist peace a useful part of this analysis? Now, we'll, as the oldest women's peace building organization in the world, brings a strong um, understanding of an analysis of what Wilf refers to as the war economy, right? So these three interlinking forces of patriarchy, militarism, and neoliberalism. And Wilp says, okay, well, let's understand the root causes. Let's understand the ways in which these, in, these issues are in fact deeply intersectional. Um, and let's look at the systems of power and the structural drivers of violence, because to not do that 
um, is in some ways to burden ordinary men in local communities with the task of transforming their masculinities. Um, and I think this question of, you know, and Gary spoke to it eloquently, um, and I think it's, you know, kind of, it's a default statement that often gets made in, in, in discussions like this. We must attend to the structural. As part of the research that Wilf has just conducted as part of its big um, 12 country project, attempting to mobilize men for feminist peace, we engaged in research to understand some of the structural drivers in the countries that we're working in. And then we looked at a lot of the interventions that focus on addressing masculinities and men's violence. And I think, unfortunately, where we are in the evolution of the field is not many of the interventions and not much of the um, kind of quantitative research asks questions about, uh, enough questions anyway, about context, about the structural drivers, about neo-colonialism and colonialism, about corruption, um, about foreign military aid, and what those mean for um, men in local communities, men in countries, especially in the global south. And I was just reviewing a toolkit uh, developed on men, um, masculinities, and peacebuilding. The terms that got used there were not terms that I think um, would help us understand those structural factors. We There was quickly a listing of Raywan Connell's important work on hegemonic masculinity, on protest masculinities. Um, but I'm not sure that's the work that's going to be effective in mobilizing men for feminist peace. And so I think one of the questions that we have to ask is, does our focus on masculinities in some ways occlude a focus on some of the broader structural factors? And Alan Gregg and Michael Flood have written, I think, you know, very persuasively about this in their new report for UN Women or 2020 report for UN Women titled Field Formations. And they say the focus on masculinities, um, and they're quoting other feminist researchers like um, Sarah White and others, does it focus, does a focus on masculinities really divert our attention away from the structural to think about the cultural, to think about social norms? Um, and their answer and the answer of, I think, lots of people thinking about how the term masculinities gets deployed is that, in fact, it may well run the risk of doing that. And so I think we have to really give very careful consideration to whether our use of the term transforming masculinities isn't, in fact, a part of the problem that gets in the way of a focus on some of these broader structural forces. And, and I, I say that, you know, for the reasons that Alan and Michael articulate in their piece, but also because in local communities, when we work with men um, on violence prevention, on conflict prevention, and we talk about this work as being about transforming masculinities, and we invoke the many terms that get used, right? As Jeff Hearn says, we can transform masculinities, um, but what does that change? And as Sarah White says, you know, our focus on transforming masculinities quickly runs into the problem of creating as many masculinities as there are men. Um, and so I think we do need to ask whether the term we use so widely is fit for purpose. Um, and I'll close just with one additional query about that. Actually, I'll, cl I'll close with some comments about what we might do. But I think the other um, complication that we sit with at the moment is the discussions around masculinities very often push us also in an essentialist direction. If we're transforming masculinities, what is it that we're holding on to about masculinities that doesn't equally accrue to women and men and people of all gender identities? And so, do we inadvertently, by using the term uh, transforming masculinities, contribute to a shift in focus away from the structural and to an inadvertent suggestion that there's something inherently different about men and women and men and women and people of all gender identities' capabilities? Um, and so I wanted to say that I think 
you know, the, the, the necessary next step in the evolution of our work is really to think as um, is beginning to happen about how we link our work to structural forces. And again, Alan and Michael um, say, we need to think less about building a field and more about building a movement. Um, and so I think the question is, who do we partner with? Do we partner um, with entities that are focused on disarmament, that are focused on stopping structural adjustment and the evisceration of social services and public sector jobs? Um, do we focus on militainment? The fact that the Pentagon has collaborated um, with Hollywood to influence the scripts of thousands and thousands of blockbuster films, as Roger Stahl and others have now um, demonstrated is unequivocally the case. So what does the upstream work like, look like? Um, is it supporting conscientious objectors and really advocating that the US and the EU grants asylum immediately to war resistors so that men and women can resist war? Um, I think those are questions that WILP as a peace building organization established during the first world war is asking a lot. Um, what does it look like to address the feminist or to understand and use a feminist political economy lens to think a little bit more structurally about some of these issues. So I'll stop there. I know I'm two minutes over um, and really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dean. And thank you for calling attention to that structural and contextual piece of this puzzle. So we have a few online questions, but I'm gonna encourage people to continue send in questions online. But I think what we'll do now is we're gonna open it up to the floor. We've heard from our fantastic panelists who I'm sure have provoked a lot of thoughts and questions from our audience. And we're gonna take a few questions and comments and then we'll turn it back to the panelists. We'll go in reverse order hopefully giving everyone about two minutes to respond to questions and conclude. So we're all gonna have to be concise and get succinct as possible. So now it's my turn to turn it over to you. Atikin is in the back with a floating microphone. So I'll look out for hands from our audience. Okay, I see Gretchen right here and right here. Maybe. <laughs> Hi, uh, thank you so much, Nadara Yusuf with the Stimson Center. Um, I really appreciate sort of bringing together this panel as well. I think the perspectives that you've provided has really broadened a conversation that I think we've heard in many different forms in the past. So uh, quick question, one of, my, one of the things that has come out of the new agenda for peace is this sort of massive gap between the normative statements that, that Ambassador has pointed out about the patriarchy and dismantling the patriarchy versus the actual actions that the new agenda for peace has provided in tackling them. So there's, it just sort of goes back to, oh yes, WPS, YPS, we've got those tools, but it doesn't actually sort of address the gap in the problem. And this comes at the same time that we've seen backsliding in these negotiations around the summits of the future on gender-based issues. Mm -hmm. So there's almost a sort of internal patriarchal system that we're not quite addressing. Mm -hmm. And so what is the role of hot take? What is the role of, of sort of the UN agencies, member states, and institutions in, in actually addressing the structures of power within the institutions that we're using to dismantle the power itself. So how do we, you know, to flip a, a common saying on its head, dismantle the plane while we're flying it. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for those comments. Um, I think we'll take Gretchen and I believe there was a man in the front row who will take next. Thanks Phoebe. Um, Gretchen Baldwin, I'm at the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute. Um, and my question is sort of around, <laughs> staying on the broad concept of masculinities, which I have myself done a fair amount of work on in my research um, on peace operations and conflict management. This is something I struggle with in, in my own work a lot. So I'm hoping someone here can just solve it for me. Um, but I really, I'm very curious to know any of the panelists thoughts on how we approach this conceptual gap between how we talk about masculinities and then how we talk about women. So we, I don't see a lot of work, especially in the policy space, I don't really see any on femininities, occasionally in conversation with masculinities. And I myself, act, again, like as someone who works on this, from kind of all angles, I really struggle to figure out how to put that language into practice and how to highlight also multiple femininities without simply putting them sort of, 
I don't, you know, it's, I, I don't want it to be just a binary, like masculinities against femininities. Um, so I would love thoughts on that um, and, and sort of that conceptual and linguistic um, or rhetorical, I should say, uh, difference. Mike. Oh, Lord, excuse me. Oh, All right. Thank you. Well, I'm from Kiribati in the Pacific, right? You must see somebody wearing a tie like this every day, <laughs> made by the women of Kiribati, woven from the pandanas, the coconut, and the grass. They weave it together. But I, I, the relevance of this is that I am pro, I'm very much in favor of what you're discussing. I thank. Uh, International Peace Institute and all of you panelists. I mean, I've learned something a lot. In fact, my first time to be in this sort of a conversation, first time I'm in touch with IPI. I know it's, it's always there in the, in the UN uh, email, the IPI, but the first time. So thank you for this opportunity. And uh, I'd like to put a question to all of you because I believe in what you're, you're doing. You're doing great, but I know it's a long road. And uh, having been in politics for 30 years, that's my background. My former life, I was a politician for 30 years before I, now I'm learning to be an ambassador. That's a bit different. And uh, yeah, I know the problem with this gender ban, the domestic violence it is everywhere. In my country, it's there. And now it's called cultural roots. And that mix up again with modernizing. Cultural roots, okay. But once you mix it with something from outside, it becomes confusing. There's more violence, more conflict. And so as a politician for 30 years, I was playing my role. I was doing, I was educating my fellow men to be good men to women. And I said of my place is a sanctuary. Any woman who is mistreated by her husband, my home is the place. They can come and spend the weekend. Then I will have interviewed the guy who did the wrong thing to the woman. I said, why do you do this? So I do that. You see, my wife was a bit scared about that. You couldn't have the men attacking you. No, because I was a leader of my people and I believe in playing my leadership role. But I, one thing I, I, I realized that it's lacking, it's in the education system. So I want to ask you, is it possible? How possible is it to roll out an education curriculum to the whole world, goes everywhere. And then we, the people on the ground, are encouraged to, you know, to prevent it, to put it to the ground, the schools, all schools, boys, girls, to really start there, the home, boys, girls, in school, boys, girls, relationship, the boys have to learn how to be good gentlemen from, from, from small. And then there will be less conflict. But how possible is that from the UN, on, on, on the part of the United Nations, IPI and others? Thank you. Thank you. And maybe we'll take one more question or comment from the floor if there is one. Just wanna make sure we're getting it. Oh, go ahead. Thank you. My name is Antonia Olie. I represent Women for Women International. Uh, just happy to be here. Part of what we do representing Nigeria, we work with men and women since 2001. And uh, what is touching to me is based on the last comment that we need to look at messaging what is the language? Since we are uh, first to look at the language we use. When we talk about gender and you bring men, they don't want to hear about it. So what language will help us achieve our purpose? Masculinity, if you bring it, oh, you're here to bring down men. You're here to talk about that men are not good. So the messaging, the, the language that we use will actually help us to drive forward the cause. I like the last comment. And uh, when Mr. Baker was talking about issue of curriculum, you can't give what you don't have. Many of the men, they don't have understanding. This is their upbringing from the family onset. You're coming to a family and you see that a, a boy is placed above a woman. So you grew up with it. And then somebody is coming through programming to tell you that no, that what you're doing is wrong. There's no way you will accept it unless it is brought to a level that there is clarity. 
to what we are speaking to. How do we balance things? So all I'm trying to say is that we have to look at the language, the content, if we want to achieve something with men. Many men are not here being represented. It's all about women. And you're going home, giving them this information. It's like, what are you talking about? Mm. It's not in our culture. So we can't take what you're talking. You are bringing something outside our culture. So how do we, again, moving forward, try to bring down this? Whatever we have in UN uh, Resolution 1325, how do we bring it down? Participation. At what level do we want women to participate? Is it just to be there that they have a voice or they're just inclusive, but they're not saying anything that will bring a change? That's just what I want to add. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you for all the questions from the floor. I'm going to read one that came in online from um, another expert working in this space, Chantal De Jong Udrat, who said, when we talk about masculinities or do programming, we op often focus on men at the bottom of the social and economic louders. How do we get men in the so-called C-suites, those with leadership positions, those who benefit from patriarchal power structures and keep them alive? So I'm gonna go in reverse order. I'm asking our panelists two minutes each. So keep an eye on your clocks so that we don't hold our engaged in-person audience past the time. So Dean, over to you to respond to any of those questions and provide a brief closing. Great, thank you so much, Phoebe. And Chantal, thanks for the great question. Um, I was hoping I would get asked that question actually. So um, <laughs> two, two quick responses. The first is, I think the National Democratic Institute has put together a really nice um, approach to engaging men in political organizations, their men, power and politics um, toolkit, which is being rolled out in various different places, the Middle East, West Africa, um, Central Africa. And I think it's a very, very thoughtful tool for engaging men in political organizations so that they both understand the imperative of women's full political participation and actively support it. The second response, when I think about men in the corporate sector, and I'm going to draw on an example from the work that I did at Sonke Gender Justice, where we attempted to address the legacy of gold mining and silicosis and the impact it had on women in rural communities who took care of mine workers when they came back dying from silicosis, unable to breathe. Um, and essentially, the mining industry had simply displaced its responsibility of care onto those rural women. We didn't attempt to try and transform the masculinities of men in the nearly 30 gold mining companies that had intentionally and knowingly uh, exposed um, working class men, working class black men in South Africa to um, huge amounts of silica dust. What we did is we joined with a whole group of uh, human rights organizations to institute a class action lawsuit and to change South African law and to make sure that there was in fact meaningful financial compensation for uh, women caregivers and for mine workers affected by silicosis. And so I think the question in some ways is if masculinities helps us understand how those get decisions get made in C-suites around pharmaceutical pricing or around the arms trade, um, around you know, the environmental destruction that we see, is masculinity is also a useful strategy uh, to address those issues? Or do we at that point draw on a different set of strategies, including strategic litigation, um, naming and shaming, the kind of accountability work that we associate with the climate change movement or traditional women's rights organizations, um, which maybe links also to Gretchen's question, which I won't answer right now. I'll, I'll drop my comments in a chat. So thank you, hope that's helpful. Thank you, Emily, two minutes. Thank you everyone for your questions. Um, I'm gonna try to kind of connect a few questions here. For the, the question on the, like a rollout of a global education system, I think that that could be a very important tool, but I think connecting that to Antonia's question, um, it's so important to, you know, your question really spoke to the importance of local partnerships and collaborations, because what you say in one country, in one context, even, you know, in the same country, in a different part of the country, it's not going to be, you know, you're not 
you're you're going to have to communicate with people in a different way in different languages and so that's why working and supporting with and we all know this but like you know people who are on the ground like listening to them that's the best way to go about education um and kind of addressing the c-suite men question it's kind of, it's i think it's very similar where you need to use their language um and that's you know from from our perspective as a policy institute i am constantly trying to trojan horse gender into places that don't want to talk about gender don't want to think about gender necessarily um but if i frame it you know we have a report on why u.s china relations need a gender analysis um and so you know there's a lot of members of Congress and people in government who like are very interested in China and our geopolitical relations with China. But let me, you know, let me tell you about how, let me use your language, but Trojan horse gender into it. And I think that's kind of, that's a way to go about that. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah. Right. Thank you so much, colleagues, for those excellent questions. As the UN bureaucrat on the panel, I'll talk about the lack of accountability to commitments. We have 10 Security Council resolutions. We have 107 national action plans. I can't even tell you how many plans, uh, policies, programs, agendas have been developed over the last 20 years, 25 years, and none of them have really achieved the results that we want them to. I think, first of all, because they are often technical solutions to political problems, you know, by instituting a new working group or a new task force or whatever the case may be is not going to address these root causes. But another aspect that I'd like to emphasize, although there are many, but I'm trying to stick it to two, to two minutes, is the financing. Money talks. And we've seen over the last 11 years that we've been trying to measure the UN system's accountability to only allocating 15% of peace building program to gender equality. We have not been able to get the rest of the UN system to report, let alone reach that target. So that's a huge problem. We also have now commitments to multiply by five the, num the percentage of uh, ODA that goes to women's rights organizations that I mentioned before, as well as a commitment from the SG himself to help raise 300 million for women's rights organizations in conflict countries. So I think we really need the member states to hold the UN accountable to these commitments. And also we need civil society to raise your voices and make us and the member states accountable to these commitments. So I'll leave it there, thank you. I'm trying to think where to go with this at a, at a practical level. There's a lot of huge ideas in the room with big intractable problems. And I guess if I were to simplify it, I want all boys to have a feminist intersectional history lesson. Um, I, you know, I think if we look at some of the important change in the space of peace and equality in the world, a lot of them have been women-led grassroots organizations that have led to structural change. Um, I can think of why I got into this space among many other reasons I moved to Brazil a few years after a labor rights organization partnered with lots of other social justice movements, particularly the women's rights movement, overthrew a dictator um, and was very grounded in the power of feminist transformative education to create citizens who demand equality. Later on, that government became the Lula administration that also supported by women's rights groups, created one of the biggest ever poverty alleviation programs in the world, the Bolsa Familia program, supported by women's rights programs. It's probably one of the biggest income transfer programs we have in Latin America. Um, so I do believe that you know feminist politics in this, and that I believe boys can be educated in, is a motor for change that we should not overlook. Um, I don't care if you use the word masculinities in it. <laughs> it doesn't, to me, it doesn't matter what language you use in there, but I think to believe in that transformative power um, and how we can learn from those lessons is kind of, um, what well, gives me a little bit of optimism in this conversation at the end of the day. Thanks. Kat. 
as the resident bureaucrat for the United States government, um, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot to unpack with many of these questions, um, you know, kind of going to the dismantling of the plane as we fly it. I, you know, I am a bureaucrat's bureaucrat, so I advocate very much for working within systems. Dean, Dean kind of is blowing my mind a little bit, but I get in these fights with a lot of people I know, um, you know, working within the systems that are there. And, you know, for example, in the United States government, we have increased our gender funding from $1.3 billion to $2.6 billion dollars in one year. Um, that's a doubling. Sounds great, but it's only from like 5% to 10%, but okay. Um, we're getting there, uh, but looking at the systems that exist and actually implementing and changing, whether it be you know a financial system that all of a sudden becomes gender neutral when you're just making decisions based upon funding or percentages that have to change, but looking at those systems and building within them, I believe that's the best way to start making some of these structural changes. Um, and then looking at, you know, life and language is a huge, piece of how we actually um, are addressing, let's say we're working with our Department of Defense colleagues or through our military entities, working with the Marines, with other Marines to talk to them in Marine language means a lot more. I was listening to Trevor Noah actually just yesterday, and he was talking about when you talk to someone and they're speaking to you in their language or your own language, you are much more familiar and much more trusting and much more open. So all of a sudden openings happen. So meeting people where they are, finding out what those incentives are. Um, um, you know, Gary and I were talking actually about an organization we had worked together with, um, I think Abad in, in Lebanon, and they, um, you know, what they do is they talk to fathers. And one of the things that I thought was very interesting about the work that they do is the fathers that they talk to, you know, that's when they seem to be the most interested. Uh, everybody wants their family to be successful. So they talk to these fathers about if you are working and you are building your family in a peaceful and safe setting, and you are, you know, countering gender-based violence, you are much more able to have your children be successful, your family be successful. So again, speaking to people where they are, I think is, you know, goes a long way in making the changes that we, um, you know, we are trying to see. And then in terms of getting the right thing, you know, how do we change people in the C-suites and their power structures? Um, <laughs> tell me. No, I think that one of the ways that we try to do that, when we, interestingly enough, COVID had opened up and a lot of very, um, you know, uh, corporations had come to us saying, how do we get women back? How do we get women into our leadership positions after COVID? Because so many women left. Um, a lot of that really came down to data and information on you are losing money when you do not include women. So making that business case um, and making sure that people in the C-suites understand you will not, you know, you are um, going to risk losing funding or whatever it is. Again, meeting them, what, what make, makes them um, incentives. Thank you. And Ambassador Tickner to close out the panel. I don't even know what to say. I'm going to make three really fast points. First, I just want to gesture to Gary's mention um, of, of how organized right-wing fundamentalist groups are winning the battle um, in um, promoting language and practices that operate completely against um, transformation. Um, and, and, and I think one recommendation that I at least take away from, from this panel is the need to um, create more systematic um, organized action um, uh, by civil society and other actors to push back against this. We're, we're definitely losing the battle there, and there's much to be there's much to be done. Second, I just wanted to to mention the importance of transformation from below, which has also been mentioned. I'm not sure that um, seeking out transformation in state actors, sadly, is necessarily the the route that we can take today, given the profoundly patriarchal nature of states um, in their very foundations. So I think. The, the, the lessons learned from feminist um, activism, among other forms of activism, need to be taken into account when we think forward. And, and here again, we talk a lot about transforming from below, tapping into voices from below, building bottom up. But doing so in a genuine way, I think, is, is a route forward in terms of how to make these transformative ideas and practices is percolate upwards towards states um, and international organizations. Can I make one more point? Yeah. Finally. Um, We've spoken a lot about language and practice. I am a social constructivist um, in my view of reality. Um, I agree fully with the notion that language constitutes reality. I think we need to talk also about practices. And I don't want to, to not answer the question about 
how we deal with masculinities, women, and femininities. And I'll just, I'm not going to address it directly, but here's the idea. Um, one way to talk about how language and practices constitute reality is by critiquing um, a modern Western liberal worldview and, and the binarism at its root. And so how to, trans, how to transit towards a, a more relational notion of reality or a relational way of being in and, and in and with the world, I think is a route that we need to take into consideration. And here, instead of mutually exclusive opposites, I'm talking about an idea of the world in which complementarity, complementary opposites, codependence, correspondence are all the ways in which we look at reality. And, and here care becomes important. And we can talk um, precisely about multiple ways of being um, in the world that, do, that aren't mutually exclusive um, and that maybe get us out, out of the bind of, of, of how we you know, talk about masculinities and femininities without falling again in the trap of, of binarism. Sorry. Thank you so much. We'll, we'll leave on that food for thought. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you to New Lines, Equimundo, and to all of you.